this was an obvious catastrophe a long time ago. Everything you would find in a thriller novel about a, a pandemic virus, this virus checks all those boxes. Hello, and welcome to another in the series of videos with Chris Martinson. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing well, Mike. It's good to be back with you and all your followers and listeners here. Uh, why don't you tell uh, the audience what your background is in all of this? Because you have uh, some degrees. I mean, you know what you're talking about when it comes to uh, the virus and the spread of it. Sure. Uh, be glad to. My PhD that I have uh, came from Duke University. It's in, from the Department of Pathology. That's the study of diseases, including infectious diseases. And uh, that's a PhD. So I did two years with the Duke medical students, uh, same courses, same everything. They went into the clinics and I went into the labs at that point in time and, and looked and did specimen research and, and cell biological research at that point. Did a couple of years as a postdoc. So I got about seven years of science training uh, back there. And then Took a little turn, went and got an MBA at Cornell and uh, was in the pharma business and became a vice president of a pretty large company, not Pfizer. And uh, so I have a lot of uh, both corporate experience and science. And that's why I like to marry both this particular thing, what's happening with the disease and the economic impact of it. Those two things are, are uh, really, really, I think, uh, critical. The biggest in our lifetimes right now. Yeah. <laughs> Before we started the video, we were just sharing some of our uh, preparation because I got prepared like back at the end of January mm -hmm. and uh, I'm pretty much done with all of my prep. Um, I don't see yet the panic starting to happen at the local supermarkets and stuff. People still think that it's not going to come to Puerto Rico. That, <laughs> that, I mean, uh, even my brother, I've been trying to get, uh, they're, they're in Utah, my brother and his wife. And I've been calling his wife and said, are you prepared? Did you buy any masks? Do you have this? Do you have that? And my brother texts me and says, Stop, uh, you know, making Marley panic. It's <laughs> he thinks, he goes, so some people in Washington died. It's not coming here. We're in Utah. <laughs> mm -hmm. People just yeah. want to stick their head in the sand. It's amazing. I, I know, I know. And, and, and it, it's, there's this very inappropriate um, idea running around that there's only two states you can exist in. One is in ignorance and ignorant bliss, and the second is in a state of panic. Uh, you and I know there's a lot of territory between those two extremes, and, and I really object to the word panic. It comes up a lot. comes up a lot. I see the CDC uses it, and anchors are using it. We don't want people to panic, and I, I'm like, well, no, but you would want people to have an appropriate level of concern so they would take action, right? You know, if, you're, if you walk out into a busy highway, hopefully, you know, you notice the cars and trucks whizzing by, you, you get an awkward feeling in your body, and you say, maybe I need to get out of this situation, right? There's, there's a reason that our bodies and our, are, are wired for risk, right? And all of our forebears manage that. That's why we're here. So managing risk is a really important part of, of being part of life. But a lot of people have abdicated that to an, a, an external authority. They don't want to think about the risks. And that's fine. But that's not the same thing as having a prudent, uh, well-reasoned approach to all of this. And so for people who are preparing, well, you know, you know, listen, kudos to them. And it's, I think it's an appropriate thing for people to understand what the risks are, understand what might happen because they've been very transparent about that stuff, right? And how you should prepare in advance of that. So what are they going to do? They've talked to us about it. They said, well, you know, we can't contain this thing anymore. Now we're down to mitigation strategies. Fancy word, Mike, which says they're going to go for what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs. Look it up. The CDC has a whole giant set of papers around this. What does that mean? That's a fancy word for we're going to shut your schools down. We're going to close down any large gatherings. If we have to, we're going to give you a, a self-imposed quarantine. And if that doesn't work, we're going to put you in a contained quarantine, meaning you have no choice in the matter. Uh, and so those are things people just should be aware of and be prepared for. And that's why people are out there buying food and other supplies, not because they're panicking, but because they've said, wow, there's a chance that we could be in a quarantine imposed or, or you know, otherwise. And I would like to have some food in my house as a response to that. Very, very logical, very organized, and, and nothing panicky about that at all. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, again, there's a lot of territory before you get to panic. I, I, don't, I don't panic till they tell me not to. Then, well, then one of the things that I want to avoid is, is during the peak of uh, this pandemic, uh, you know, when it's in my area and it's peaking, I don't want to be going to the store and touching stuff. I don't want to be getting packages from Amazon and, uh, you know, 
through UPS and the mail simply because this virus can survive on surfaces for so long. Yes, it can survive up to nine days on steel. So that would be things like doorknobs, um, railings, handrails, uh, places like that, plastic, which might be a, an, an escalator rail or a button on a, in an elevator. Very unfortunately, Dr. Redfield, of the director of the CDC, came out two day, three days ago now and said, oh, it only survives for a couple of hours. Uh, and he's wrong because what he was referring to was influenza. This isn't influenza. This is a coronavirus. Uh, the, we have data from 20 plus studies that tell us how long it survives in surfaces. So when we're getting that kind of bad information from who are supposed to be our central leading authorities, that's what causes people like myself to lose a little faith, lose some trust that if they get the little details wrong, are they also getting the big details wrong? Yeah, you know, I was, I've done some math on this. The, uh, the World Health Organization upped their estimate of the death rate from 2.7% up to, I think, 3.4% mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. And, and then another advisor of the World Health Organization said that two-thirds of the planet could catch this virus. <laughs> and you do the math, and you come out with, you know, 175 million deaths. Uh, is the... So we're going to have millions of deaths eventually. Uh, it may not be 100 million. You know, it may just be a few million. Uh, but uh, one of the problems we've got in the United States is this lack of testing and the bungling of the CDC. Uh, for every case that they say we've got, we probably actually have, what, five or 10 times more people out there that have not been diagnosed that are spreading it? What, what do you think? I think it's at least 100 times more, and I'll tell you wow. why. Um, so we have some data now. So remember, patient one in the United States was a gentleman. He came back from Wuhan, China, didn't feel well, heard about the news, self-isolated, then went into a hospital because he, it took a turn for the worse. He spent five or six days in intensive care and came out of that thing, and that was patient one in the United States. And of course, we said, oh, look, we treated him with some remdesivir, this new, new compound, and he got better, and so this is all good, yay. Uh, the problem is that just four, three days ago now, uh, what happened was uh, a teenager in Washington, same state he, this uh, patient one was from, got tested, has this coronavirus. And the problem with this is, is that when they did the genotyping on it, it was the exact same strain, and they're six weeks apart, which means this person passed it on. And it had been circulating undetected in this environment for at least six weeks in this one case. Same thing in Germany. One woman comes over, infects a few people. They were okay. But when they did the typing on it just today, they discovered that all of these cases are now linked all through Italy, uh, are linked to this case. So this thing jumps very, very easily. This is what your listeners need to understand. This is like if flu, if I have the flu, I might on average give it to 1.28 other people. If I have this thing, I might give it to six or seven, right? That's right. a huge, and if I give it to six or seven and they give it to six or seven and they give it to six or seven, that's an exponential process which says, yeah, 40 to 60% of the world gets infected with this thing at some point. And the question is now, how fast? And that's the thing we care about because testing will allow you to catch those cases so it doesn't spread as quickly. It might still spread, but if you can make that run more slowly, then your hospitals don't get overwhelmed. You don't get these massive outbreaks that, that crush your system. And that's the part we'd really like to avoid. That's where the CDC has done uh, an unspeakably bad job uh, at, at testing. It's, it's really right. mystifying. It's uh, this level of incompetence uh, just sort of raises the question, are they actually going to be like guilty of manslaughter? Them and the, the, the World Health Organization, they're bungling and then they're wanting to keep people in a state of willful ignorance, uh, uh, not alerting people to uh, what the facts are, just the science behind it. Uh, this is, is almost criminal. Uh, but yeah, so what do you think of that? Well, it, 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 it is, and it's unspeakably bad because, listen, I have a degree in pathology, but I didn't dedicate my life to studying infectious diseases. And I put out an alert back on January 23rd and then a first video on the 24th, which basically has all the information that's just now coming out from the CDC. They're just now saying, oh, it looks like it really does spread really rapidly. And it looks like uh, there is aerosol transmission possibly. And it looks like, uh, you know, it, it does have a very high case fatality rate. This stuff was all known by me because all I did was, was read what was coming out of China and I read science papers 
many of them weren't peer reviewed, but you don't get peer reviewed in this kind of a circumstance. So just if you were just looking at the data, this was an obvious catastrophe a long time ago. Everything you would find in a thriller novel about a, a pandemic virus, this virus checks all those boxes. So it should have been sending off giant alarm bells and it didn't, or we have to guess that something else was running. Like they took one look at the, at the same parameters and they said, geez, there's no stopping this. Might as well not panic people. I don't know what they were up to, but it wasn't anything that you or I would say that feels like a good, solid, trustworthy result. And by the way, I do think it is, it is uh, very worthy of condemnation because Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore doing a spectacular job of managing this. So in the case of, of South Korea, if you had it, they would find everybody you'd had contact with, isolate everybody. They would then send out a text message that's geographically placed so that if somebody's phone walks within a certain distance of where you had, you had presented with this, their phone would alarm, they'd read a text, they'd say there was a known case of coronavirus in here, and then it would the contact tracing. So if you had been to a store, they would say, and also this person had been to this store. So you would then have that information and you would then be able to adjust your behavior. And because of that, they're containing it very, very well. Here, we don't even know who patient one uh, contacted and was in, in, in you know, uh, connection with. We have no idea. Yeah. We, don't, we weren't doing that level of contact tracing and we weren't testing. So all the things you should be doing aren't being done in the United States. And I think that's a very bad setup. Yeah, I think uh, the United States is going to be as, as bad as China uh, pretty soon, within a month or two. You know, when you look at the Chinese numbers, uh, it would by the end of July, there was about a thousand times more people than near the, you know, it was progressing at a rate of 1,000 times per month until they really just shut down their entire economy. Which brings me to the next topic. I want to talk about the economic consequences of this because uh, what we've, the draconian measures that you've talked about in your videos, today you showed uh, some maps of uh, nitric oxide levels uh, and you talked about Apple and supply chain disruption. And you know, one of the things that uh, I worry about is almost all of our prescription medicines or the ingredients for the prescription medicines come from there. And if your own population is uh, infected and dying, and you, even if there is some sort of vaccine that is developed, uh, if, if a lot of the medicines come from there, are they going to keep them there and use them on their own population and only ship them outside once they reach a production level that, it, that exceeds what their needs are? Uh, so let's talk about all the economic consequences of this uh, because this almost, I mean, the world is so highly leveraged right now uh, when it comes to the amount of debt and the, the stock markets in such hyper bubbles and real estate back into bubbles and the Federal Reserve uh, and the world's central banks have been doing stimulus during this entire economic expansion they've been stimulating still instead of just at the beginning of it and then letting the free market work. Uh, and it just really worries me that this could be like financial Armageddon. I'm, I don't want to be an alarmist, but uh, uh, I really, th Apple being such a huge percentage of the stock market's value. Uh, and so tell us about what you were talking about today in your video with Apple and, uh, and then the uh, nitro nitrogen oxide levels. Yeah. So uh, listen, we don't have a lot of good data coming out of China. It's been a, a battle all the way through. They, they had put a full firewall on their data for a long time ago. I was, for a while, we had all these videos from inside Wuhan hospitals and people falling over in streets, and then they just stopped. And so we've been kind of peering in from the outside. Fortunately, we still have satellites running around. So I've been going to satellite data to ask macro questions like, how much coal is China burning as a proxy for, for industrial activity? Or how much Nitric oxide are they creating, which is, you know, that comes out of tailpipes and smokestacks and says you're burning stuff, right? Um, so those are proxies for economic activity. China says they're getting back to work, but guess what? When we look at the satellite data, the signals of economic activity aren't there. So I think China's saying one thing, but really their economic activity hasn't come. So you mentioned the first thing that concerns me even more than Apple, uh, which is the idea that China is an enormous manufacturer, in some cases, a sole source manufacturer of a lot of chemical precursors and needed compounds. The United States gets 97% 97%, of its antibiotics from China. 
hey, we get uh, some of our other pharmaceuticals from India, but India gets almost all of its precursor chemicals from China. So India has just announced it has its first clusters of cases that have, of coronavirus that have popped in. And uh, just yesterday, they announced that they are suspending an immediate suspension, all export of 150 um, pharmaceutical ingredients, which could be things like paracetamol, which is made into acetaminophen, all clindamycin, which is an important antibiotic, which I had the last time I had an impacted tooth. That's what my dentist gave me. No more of that's being exported. So they're defensively preserving what they've got for their own people, which I understand, but they were a major, major exporter of generic drugs and a huge, like 60% of the total supply of drugs consumed in the United States. Pharmaceuticals come from India and they're manufacturing. So they're just yesterday, we'll have to find out what they did today, but here's how this worked. China shut down its manufacturing. They don't make the chemicals. They had a little extra feed stock of that in India. They were hoping it would resolve. It didn't. So now they clamped all that down. And now we're, this isn't, you know, you know, as we're speaking, I think the s and is up 80 some points because the Fed threw a hundred billion in last night just to keep everything going. But people need to know that our dependence on these drugs, this is going to be, this is an emerging catastrophe right now for people who are dependent on those. And we don't have other sources. We don't have a domestic, you know, manufacturing facility. We're just like, oh, well, let's just, we'll just start making clindamycin. It's not that simple. Could we do it again? Yes. Is it going to happen in the next few months? No. So this is a really critical period of time where people need to be aware of, of that particular dynamic. And the same thing's happening with Apple. You know, they got this Foxconn set of plants over there and each plant has maybe a thousand sub suppliers that have to produce components. If any one of those is a critical sub supplier and they're missing a single component, like your camera array, you know, no longer is being manufactured. You can't produce any iPhones without a camera array or whatever the sub component is, right? So there's no, there, and it's not like, Apple's just going to say, well, we'll just move that over to Vietnam, you know, because they have thousands of, of process engineers involved in producing that single phone. It's, it's just an enormously complicated supply chain. One does not simply go, oh, we'll just do this over there, right? You could, but it's going to be a year if that was your process, right? I would bet at least a year. So yeah, these I would put an S after that. It'll be years. <laughs> years. Yeah, we could put a, we could pluralize that. But I mean, it's just such an enormous supply shock. That's what I'm trying to alert people to is I don't know how it's going to turn out. All we can do is see the missing nitric oxide and understand just how the Apple's not going to resolve this anytime soon. And then what do you do with that information, right? And I really think people need to be ready for that. And I think there's a huge economic shock coming. You know, I'm fond of saying every bubble is in search of a pin. Well, we had m multiple nested bubbles in every asset class I could think of. And this is not just a pin. This was like a, a rifle round that came through. Uh, it's a shotgun. I mean, yeah. it's hitting every bubble at once here. Yeah, shotgun. What I, like I call the almost everything bubble. I don't call it the everything bubble. I used to years ago. But I call it the almost everything bubble because gold and silver are not in a bubble when you compare them to the expansion of the currency supply, when you compare them to the valuations of the stock market. They haven't kept up with the rest of the stuff in society that has been yeah. inflated by this, uh, the reckless policies of the world's central banks, uh, you know, being led by the Federal Reserve, basically. Um, it's, it's, I, it's just criminal what they're doing. Uh, I've been writing about a, a lot of this in my book, and what I'm worried about is the high amount of leverage. When you look at required reserves, right? Required reserves are supposed to be 10% of deposits. Well, uh, M2 is something like 15 trillion, but MZM, the portion of that 15 trillion that's of M2 that's instantly available is 17 trillion. <laughs> MZM is higher than M2 somehow. So the <laughs> money of zero maturity, money that that's you can weird. draw instantly, exceeds the broadest measure of the currency supply by $2 trillion. Uh, the amount of backing that has, though, with reserves, the required reserves that the banks are supposed to have, is supposed to be 10%. But when you divide these, I've made a chart on it, it's like 1.4% right now. It's because there's a whole bunch of different categories of deposits that don't require any reserves. Uh, so we're in a very, we've got this super intricate system, and we've protected it from all outside shocks. So it's not anti-fragile, it's extremely fragile. Uh, and, and then this high degree of leverage. And I just uh, worry about the outcome of this. And, you know, so 
in part of my preparation, I've got some cash at home also. And I just bought uh, three Tesla power walls for the ranch that I'm trying to buy right now. So I'm getting ready with my own solar, my own water source. Uh, and you've, you're pretty much doing the same, right? Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, I really believe in being uh, redundant and resilient. Fortunately, I live on a, a really nice uh, spread that I, I managed to close on in just in January of this year. So you see the house behind me, but the real asset of this is, um, is the 25 acre uh, field of, of really high quality farm soil that's right out there. And I've got several thousand feet of frontage on a river with great water. So to me, the real assets in this story, and again, I don't think the bubbles hit here yet really either, is uh, back to real wealth. That's yep. going to be gold, it's silver, it's land, it's water, it's the stuff our grandfathers and great-grandfathers and mothers would have recognized and remembered. Um, we'll get back to that story again. I, I think we're at the tail end of, it wasn't, you know, people say, Chris, what happened with the housing bubble? Like, that's an, that a side bubble. That's a little bubble attached to the side of this thing that kicked off with the abandonment of the gold standard back in 71. And we've been running more and more, you know, bubbly sort of experiments ever since with the idea that we could grow infinitely exponentially forever. And that turned out it's a bad idea. I mean, honestly, yeah. honestly, kids could work out why it's a bad idea, but somehow our monetary and fiscal authorities really got locked into it. It's like, no, it has to be this way, you know? And so uh, they've created this world of immense debt, immense leverage, IOUs that aren't even part of the actual debt pile, which things like unfunded liabilities, pensions, endowments, and, um, you know, all sorts of things, which, you know, weird stuff. And then there's a derivatives on top of that. So it's this big, giant, inverted pyramid of claims. And I think that when the world wakes up and says, actually, we don't want the claims anymore, we want the real stuff, like what I just talked about, your ranch and what you just talked about, that's the real wealth, you know? And when all yeah. those claims try and come back down and say, we'd rather have real stuff, thank you very much, we discover there aren't that many real things out there compared to claims, right? So uh, kind of odd that people who have money of zero maturity are going to discover they have a claim on something that doesn't actually exist. That's yeah. going to be a hard moment, right? Absolutely. So we got to wrap this up now, but uh, you and I both agree that this is the time to own real things, not, uh, not derivatives of things, not claims on things. Uh, and all of those claims, a lot of them are just going to evaporate into thin air, <laughs> where they came from. So thank you very much, Chris. This has been a fascinating uh, series of interviews, and we'll do it again sometime soon. Thanks. All right. Thanks. I would advise, you know, if you want to see my YouTube videos on all this, just check out chrismartinson.com. But again, I'm just advising everybody, just, just prepare, right? Just what, what I'm sure you've been talking to your people about is food, yeah. water, medicine, money. I mean, by which I mean the currency stuff, real money, um, by the, the hard stuff. But yeah, people need to get ready for this because it's, it's, it's a real thing. So it's Chris Martinson, D-O-T, com, right? Is your YouTube, YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, dot. Okay. Just come by peakprosperity.com and we've, we're posting all the videos there too, yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, for everybody that's listening, if you got anything from this video, please uh, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. All right, bye-bye.